Today, um, I, I want to say that God can turn tragedy into triumph. Yeah. Tragedy into triumph. Um, God's house is a house of triumph. We come to Him uh, victorious and uh, knowing that He is with us and will empower us to move through any situation. God's house is a house of triumph. And I want to look at the third and fourth chapters of the book of Ruth. We did one and two um, earlier. And, uh, um, and just see how things turn, um, how God turned Naomi's tragedy into triumph. Uh, I remember being at a 21st birthday party. One of our youth group was turned 21. Colin and his dad, um, Alan, had visited the church when we first came here down from Shepparton. And... Uh, we're having a great time at this party and my dad, Fred, walked in and walked over to me and he said, can you come out to the foyer? And uh, I thought, this is weird. He never comes to church. Um, and uh, and he said, well, so we go out um, to the foyer and he told us uh, that my sister had died that afternoon from a massive stroke. It all seemed a bit surreal. You know, she was only 33 and I could hardly believe what my father was saying. What a tragedy. She had three kids, Jenny, Peter, and two-year-old Jason. And you've met Jason, who comes occasionally. My sister had been told that her blood pressure was too high to have any more kids. And uh, in those days when they said no more, they really meant it. Unfortunately, she felt pregnant again. And it is believed that that's what turned BP skyrocketing and caused her death. You know, in that blur, um, that moment, someone said the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. That could sound harsh, but I didn't take it that way. Um, I believe as they said, said it was like the first time I heard the voice of God speaking to me. And um, I didn't understand why I felt such a measure of peace. Not that the Lord had taken her away, but the Lord was in control. He was there. And somehow that gave me peace. And then as I thought about it over the next couple of days, um, uh, I realised that only two weeks earlier, uh, we had had a great opportunity to talk to my sister Wendy about Jesus. It was probably the first time that we'd had a real opportunity to tell her what Jesus meant to us and what he could mean to her. How could God turn this tragedy and all the troubles the family faced into triumph? And more of that story later. First, let's recap on chapters 1 and 2 in the book of Ruth and see where all the action took place. And uh, Elimelech and Naomi are driven by famine from their Jewish homeland uh, near Bethlehem uh, to the land of Moab. So if you're looking at Israel... Um, yeah, so I'll do it this way. So we're both talking the same right left hand side. So you've got the Mediterranean Sea like this, you've got Israel here, and Moab is south and east, southeast of Israel. Looks like desert on the map when you look at it. I don't know how they live. But you know, the, during their 10 years there, Naomi's husband and her two married sons died. So under these tragic circumstances, Naomi decides to return home to the area around Bethlehem, accompanied by her daughter-in-law, Ruth. And there's lots of stuff that I talked about last time that I won't touch there, but a very quick book to read if you want to. So as we unpack this story, we see how God turns Naomi's tragedy and troubles into triumph. And I want to say to you today, if you're feeling like uh, you're in trouble, if you're feeling like, you know, what's going to happen for the rest of my life, God can turn that turmoil into triumph. All this happened around Bethlehem, the future birthplace of King David, and many years later, our Saviour, Jesus Christ, was born. So let's recap then on um, what, 3 and 4. And I'm just rushing through this. So when they return to Israel, Ruth um, works in Boaz's field uh, um, for about six weeks. Um, right through the barley and the wheat harvest. And uh, Naomi then instructed her to approach Boaz and uh, her actions actually asked Boaz to marry her. And it was a custom that they had. And um, she agreed. 
uh, Boaz provided a, 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 a Boaz agreed, provided a closer relative refused to marry her. So they had this scene where if, if um, a husband died, that a brother would marry the wife so that man's children would continue on and that the clan would continue on. So there was someone else who was a closer relative than Boaz and he went immediately the next day and if you read the story, they're obviously so much in love. He's an older man, she's a young, good-looking woman, but she chooses him. So um, he gets the release of that other obligation and, uh, and uh, he announces his marriage there to the people that, uh, yes, he would like to redeem uh, Ruth's land, uh, Naomi's land, and, and take Ruth as uh, his wife, making their relationship official and binding. And in, in due time, God blessed Ruth with a son who is cared for now by a joyful Naomi. So this child became uh, the grandfather of David, Israel's greatest king. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> she was a Moabitess. Not, Jews and, and Gentiles didn't meet, mix. But those who chose to follow God, those who were called God followers, who wanted to become part of God's um, chosen people, were allowed to come in and uh, share many of the blessings. So as the story um, goes on, um, we see that personal tragedies can turn into triumphs as we trust God and keep doing our best. You know, sometimes we just get so tired and, and we don't do our best. But you know, if you want to reach that full blessing of God, keep going. Do your best all the time. So number one, obedience is key to transformation. If you want your life transformed, you have to listen for the Holy Spirit to speak to you. And he does that by a thought a word that's in the Word of God or an impression that you get on your heart. And, and if you just go do what the Holy Spirit said, um, uh, you, you'll, you'll, you'll just walk into that blessing time and time again. But here there's no mention of the Holy Spirit in, in these passages. But if you'll just indulge me, uh, I want to suggest that Naomi, Naomi's uh, actions in speaking into Ruth's life is the same gentle way the Holy Spirit speaks into our lives today. The Holy Spirit wants to redeem us. He wants the best for us, so he guides us in the ways of God. I'll just read Ruth 3, 1 to 6. One day Naomi said to Ruth, My daughter, it's time that I found a permanent home for you so that you will be provided for. Boaz is a close relative of ours and he's been very kind in letting you gather grain with his young women. Tonight, it will be winnowing the barley at the threshing floor. And you see, they took advantage of, of what God provided. I mean, um, in the evening, uh, this wind blew across this place. And so as they threw the barley or the wheat up, the husks separated and they were able to um, separate it and gather it all. Um, and so that's what winnowing is for those who don't understand. I'm not sure how we do it today. We've probably got a machine that does it. Uh, shakes it out. Now do as I tell you. Take a bath. Put on some perfume. Dress in your nicest clothes. Then go to the threshing floor. But do not let Boaz see you until he's finished eating and drinking. Be sure to notice where he lies down. Then go and uncover his feet and lie down there. He will tell you what to do. I will do everything you say, Ruth replied. So she went down to the threshing floor at, the, at night and followed the instructions of her mother-in-law. And that was the custom, to go, and obviously if you've got cold feet, you wake up. And um, so she uncovers his feet, she lays there, and he blesses her for choosing him over all the young men that desired her. And he knew her in life. There was this unspoken communication as you read the story. So Ruth was obedient to Naomi's suggestion. She followed her promptings and was rewarded by God for her faithfulness to Boaz. Her union with Boaz produced the grandfather of King David and Jesus came from the line of David. So Ruth's life, <coughs> pardon me, Ruth's life had gone from tragedy, losing her husband, to triumph. Her life had been transformed. Um, her life in Moab was fruitless. She was there 10 years and we can presume she was married for most of those 10 years. 
um, and she was childless. Naomi's decision to return to the promised land was the only way her tragedy could be transformed into triumph. Secondly, our God is a redeeming God. He redeems us. What does that mean? If I pawned Frank at cash converters, I would have to take the ticket and the money that I got for him to pay him back. So that's what God has done. He's, as Ruth so eloquently said, um, Jesus paid for our sin. He redeemed us by sacrificing for us. So we've got a God who's a redeeming God, a God who acts on our behalf when we cry out to him. See, Naomi's tragic life had caused her to be bitter at the Lord because she blamed him for the death of her husband, Elimelech, and her two sons. She thought, if the God of Israel is all-powerful, why didn't he protect my family? But the truth is, she shouldn't have left, uh, felt that way, because she'd agreed to move away from the promised land to search for a better life. But life is never better away from God. Famine caused them to come out from under God's care and protection. This is the way the Old Testament speaks to us, that God has a, has a place for us and he has care and protection. And, um, you know, we say we want to go here, we want to go there. Well, we, as Christians, we should only do it if God tells us to do it. If God hadn't told me to come to this place, through two or three witnesses, I would still be an Anglican minister. Because I will not go where he doesn't tell me to go. Amen. See, they left their inheritance behind in Bethlehem and lived and died in a strange uh, land with strange people and strange gods. Only Naomi and Ruth came out alive. Ophar chose to go back to her family, to their gods, to the gods who can't redeem. She chose to go back to her old life. Like so many people today who choose not to break with their old ways and never really know God intimately. They just know about him. So has God changed your life in the last week? Has he challenged you about something in the last week, the way you've behaved? Have you responded to him? That's how we need to hear him. But Ruth chose Naomi's people and the God of Israel as her God. Father God is a redeeming God. And he was going to redeem uh, Naomi's life. Boaz was family and as such, he was one of the eligible men to be a kinsman redeemer. That is, uh, he, he not only um, bought Naomi's land because she was uh, too old to get pregnant and have an heir for her, husband in that, uh, for her husband's land, the redeemer would have to marry Ruth to keep that family branch alive. So we need to understand the purpose of a kinsman redeemer. The duty of a kinsman redeemer was more than uh, the duty to preserve the family name. It was to keep the land allotted to the members within the clan. When Israel came into the promised land during the days of Joshua, the land was divided up amongst the tribes and the family groups. Do you remember that? God intended that the land should stay within these tribes and families so the land could never be permanently sold. You know, so every 50 years, it was called the year of Jubilee, and it had to be returned to their original family group. So nobody ever... Um, hi guys, welcome. Please have a seat, we'll be two seconds. Um, so every 50 years, the land had to be uh, returned to their original family groups. And, uh, and 50 years is a long time, isn't it? Uh, so God provided for, the, for any land that was sold, that it might be redeemed back into the family by a kinsman redeemer. So the kinsman redeemer had the responsibility to protect the person, the property, and the posterity of the larger family. That is, all the future generations of the family. That was his job. And that's what he did when he took the responsibility of uh, Ruth and Naomi into his house. All these duties were part and parcel of being the kinsman redeemer. And Father God is our redeemer. He sent Jesus to redeem future generations by dying on the cross. He paid the price for our inherited sin nature. You know, God created all of us 
And when Adam and Eve disobeyed God, and that disobedience tattooed sin into mankind, and only he had a plan to redeem us through his Son. Because he's a redeeming God. That's, that's what he does. You know, in Romans, the Apostle Paul was uh, probably in Rome in prison, and he wrote a lot of letters from there. Uh, but uh, Romans 5 verse 8 said, But God showed his great love for us, by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. So while we were still doing the worldly stuff and pleasing ourselves, and uh, um, God sent Christ for everyone. And because he's a redeeming God, he, he turns tragedy into triumph by transforming our lives through faith. And thirdly, um, when all is lost, seek God. When all is gone. Tragedy is part of the human experience. Not because it's God's will, but because we live in a fallen world. We live in a world where some people think they can do anything they like, not counting the cost to others, but to fulfil their own desires. Have you met someone like that? Everybody gets hurt in life by someone like that. <coughs> Naomi thought she had lost everything. Her husband, her sons were gone. She decided to go back home to Israel and Bethlehem to her own people. She went back bitter, but God made her better. She was bitter about her sons and her husband dying. But he gave her back her position in the community through Boaz and Ruth's marriage and the birth of Obed. The family line continued. She was so happy nursing the grandchild she thought she'd never see. When we seek God, he turns our tragedy into triumph. He transforms us into his people. Um, to this day, I still don't know if my sister Wendy was a Christian when she died. I hope she was. She was greatly loved and she loved everybody. Some things we won't understand until we go to be with Jesus, but you know, our God is a redeeming God. Uh, Dawn had the privilege to see her niece Jenny um, give her life to Jesus. And the children also made commitments when they were young. You know, they're now in various stages of walking away from God, but that's okay. That's okay. Because we keep on praying for the family, uh, like we pray for one another, like we pray for the community. We pray that God will move. And, uh, you know, I got a great confirmation on Friday. An awesome answer to prayer. Um, one of our young pastors in ACM who been, I've been praying for for three years, um, he told me at a conference three years ago that he had a blood disease, that he'd always had a blood disease, and he really struggled um, with doing, well, everything he did. Well, um, he told me um, he'd been to the specialist last week, and um, he'd been completely healed. The, the specialist said to him, go and live a normal life. He said, I've never heard that before. I've always had to be careful with infection and all sorts of things. See, when we pray, it's powerful. God has a way of doing things that we have no idea. You know, Naomi thought she was going home bitter, but God made it better. And, um, you know, God can do that for all of us. See, God can take a potential tragedy and turn it into a triumph. You know, we've seen cancers healed here. We've seen other people, um, uh, you know, who weren't able to have children, have children. Yeah. It's just amazing what God does. Andrew and Wendy had tried for some years to conceive, but when they, uh, they'd been through heartache of losing a baby, and as, you know, Wendy said, um, Carol, um, Wendy's mum, had shared that vision of, of holding a baby seven years earlier, so they held on to that. Incredible vision. And God wants to give us hope. Um, you know, if there's anyone hopeless here, God wants to give you hope if we cry out to him. Um, God encouraged Andrew and Wendy through people um, he brought across their path with comforting words and continual prayer. So I, I, have, a, I have a list of everybody in the church and I write down their prayers, but the prayers that I really know I have to pray is when God stir something up in you and you get a person's name and so you just start praying for that person. You know, that's when you don't keep watching the telly, that's when you get up and you go into your room and you pray. And I, I prayed a lot for young Owen and Wendy and Andrew. I prayed a lot and a lot of people do. But there's the result. Isn't it awesome? <laughs> so 
God, our God, can turn tragedy into triumph. And, and I believe he turned Andrew and Wendy's tragedy into triumph in young Owen. And we thank God for Owen Andrew. So let's just pray. Father, we just thank you for the day. We thank you for your love, for your presence with us, Lord, that you are inside us, that your word teaches us. And um, we pray to move from any tragedy, any troubles into triumph through Jesus. Help that to be our, our, our message today, this week, to take away with us, to give those trials, those troubles to you. In Jesus' name, amen. We've got a presentation to do, so, but after that, if anyone um, would like prayer, I would love to pray for you. Oh, here we go. Okay, so the CFA have to deal with fires every summer. We all know that, and uh, some, sometimes it's caused through lightning strikes, cigarette butts carelessly uh, thrown out the window. Um, of moving cars, sparks from all sorts of tools and machinery. Um, they also have to fight fires deliberately lit for fun or for reasons the perpetrators themselves may not even understand. But we want to honour these brave men and women today. We, we, uh, they truly are heroes in our community. We believe that. They put their lives on the line um, all the time. Every time that siren blasts, phew, they're there. They serve and protect our community uh, when the fires come threatening destruction. So to honour them, we want to give them a gift today. And uh, uh, I was talking to Peter um, at the, uh, at the uh, Wonga Park Primary School 120th celebration. And he said, you know, we're just thinking about buying a fridge and it's about a grand. I said, wow, that's a coincidence. We've just had a rock night. And raise the grand for you guys. So they agreed to come. So I'm going to put the mic. So would you like to come and say anything? Uh, anyway, we just want to bless you. And, uh, The only money we get funded is from the, the government CFA slash for our, our trucks and our fuel um, and basic equipment like our you know, issues equipment. Um, things like this fridge that um, on our tanker, when the truck goes away, on strike teams might be away for you know, two days, 24 hours, or a week, or even a month. Um, currently, we have a, a, an esky there, we put ice on it and the truck leaves, but obviously the ice melts you know, yeah. 40 degrees you know, after about three or four hours. So um, the fridge will be perfect. We can have that fitted in the truck and mounted in the truck so that. Keep our drink and food you know, cold for the duration of the fire. So, um, and yeah, we're looking at buying one probably in the next month. So, it was when I mentioned last week, it was handy. Um, so, yeah, definitely thank you. It's a, a good asset for us. Um, something we couldn't buy through funding from the government. So, we'd have to raise money ourselves. And um, through the community, so it's just another way we can yeah. improve what we do to the community. Um, I'll do a bit of a fire talk. Um, so, how many people live in Wonka Park here or in the, this area? Few but not a lot, okay. So just make sure that you know obviously you prepare your properties coming up to summer now. Um, our biggest threat to Wonga Park if the fire comes from the north or from the south by south Warren right area during a wind change. So you know, if you look at topography from here to the north, there's no infrastructure to stop the fire, there's no major roads, there's no they've got the Yarra River, but the fire will jump down in about 10 seconds. So just be mindful if the fire ever comes into Wonga Park, um, the place is going to stop is probably um. Croydon Hills and Marina Highway. So that's the bad news for the day, but that's most mm -hmm. people don't understand, understand that. But, um, the risk to Wonga Park is pretty big if there's a big fire coming through. So yeah, we do 24 hours a day, seven days a week, you know, we've got car accidents, house fires and so forth. So mm -hmm. I guess you. we'll help us all year through. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. 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 So Father, we uh, just live Peter and Elliot and all the other guys and girls up at the Wonga Park Fire Station and every CFA and fire station, Lord, we ask you to watch over them this fire season, protect them, give them wisdom and uh, understanding about the winds and, uh, uh, Lord, just uh, get them out of any tight situations, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.
of tea and coffee in there to celebrate uh, Owen's dedication. And if anyone wants prayer, I'm happy to pray with you now. Oh, and the big red truck is out there, children. <laughs> okay. <laughs> 